So you know there's been an ongoing uh, genocide in Yemen since 2015. Um, it started with the go-ahead, the green light from uh, the Obama administration for Saudi Arabia. And they backed up that genocide. The U.S. has backed up that genocide uh, ongoing up until this point. And now they're talking about pulling back. Well, Biden has been talking about trying to change, basically change the um, arrangement that's going on now uh, with this ongoing genocide in Yemen. Two things that he's doing that stick out for me in relation to Iran is that they blame Iranians uh, for attacks on Saudi Arabia and also helping the Houthis or Ansar Allah, which is the other name for the Houthis. And uh, this p particular professor who I'm going to show some clips from, uh, he's from the, he's a, an associate professor who's written a book called Destroying Yemen. And uh, he's from Stockholm and he was interviewed by um, Aaron Maté from the Grey Zone. And uh, this professor said, associate professor said that uh, it, it, it is sort of untrue that Iran has been um, providing weapons and this and the like because um, forces from Saudi forces the different forces um, have actually abandoned weapons in that region and so they're using those weapons the uh, Ansar Allah are using those weapons and uh, also you know you can get weapons I think on the black market so this idea that Iran is helping with that particular conflict or I wouldn't sh I shouldn't call it a conflict that the Iranians are helping Ansar Allah the Houthis uh, in that conflict is most likely false and that Biden is talking about protecting Saudi Arabia which means that it's probably boots on the ground in Saudi Arabia which I think has already happened that then so that's basically um, a a way of uh, at some point turning on Iran and saying that it's because Iran has been a attacking Saudi Arabia that uh, and also helping the the designated terrorist group Ansar Allah which Trump had designated them a terrorist group um, just before he left, that uh, that that can lead to a war on Iran, which would make Israel very happy. Israel is one of the U.S. empire's greatest allies, and also does proxy wars uh, for it. Is a sort of proxy force for the U.S. Uh, in relation to Syria and that in that region, when the U.S. wants them to do something for them, and it works. It, it benefits both parties basically. So anyway, that is an opening for a a, a war on Iran as well as this um, myth, this ongoing lie that Iran is trying to develop a nuclear weapon. And I've mentioned in another video that um, it's actually against Islam to develop chemical weapons and we weapons of mass destruction. And that is a reason why Iran has not produced a nuclear weapon, because it's actually against their religious beliefs. It's against Islam. And they could have developed a nuclear weapon many decades ago, but they have chosen not to. But this is completely ignored by the mainstream media. It is omitted by the, main, the corporate media and it is omitted by Biden and the U.S. national security state. They don't mention that, uh, but they keep pushing this notion that Iran is, is trying to get enriched in uranium so that it can make a nuclear weapon. And they, Anthony Blinken, who is uh, the secretary of state, has actually put forward this notion that uh, Iran will have a nuclear weapon within a few weeks. You know, this is all just like the lies of the weapons of mass destruction with Iraq uh, that led to the war, the Iraq war, which is, has devastated Iraq and killed two million, at least two million Iraqi civilians. Um, this is something that they're trying to bring a whole range of, of reasons that are lies about Iran so that eventually they can invade Iran because they want Iran out of the picture. So anyway, back to Yemen. Uh, this particular book by uh, this pro associate professor, Destroying Yemen. I think it sounds like a very interesting one. Biden is probably going to change the terms of uh, engage engagement. Um, and it seems like Saudi Arabia is hemorrhaging money. It, it, this war has basically been lost uh, to by Saudi Arabia and the other coalition forces, including the US. It just hasn't uh, worked out the way they wanted it to. And surprise, surprise, one of the main reasons uh, that they have been waging war on Yemen has been t to do with oil and gas. Apparently, Yemen has huge, uh, huge reservoirs of oil. So yet again, we have another situation. You know, it's, it's Venezuela has a lot of oil. Uh, Yemen has a lot of oil. Syria has a lot of oil, which the U.S. has been stealing every month, $30 million worth of oil every month. And actually... Trump actually admitted to it, you know, that they're, they're basically taking the oil. So this is, uh, and there are other reasons why um, Yemen is 
the focal point and why they've been just dis destroying it and basically creating a genocide uh, basically creating a the greatest one of the greatest humanitarian crisis for a long time the greatest humanitarian crisis there is and that is uh, to do with oil firstly and uh, there are resources that Saudi Arabia needs because they're basically they've got brought brought in a lot of austerity into Saudi Arabia because they are hemorrhaging money and they need uh, they need water they need they want to bypass the Straits of Hormuz and they can if they have control of Yemen if those coalition forces have control of Yemen they can use use that pipeline and they don't have to uh, sort of be bothered with that area around Iran so I might be I, I'm hoping I'm explaining it okay but this is the general picture that I'm sort of gauging from from this interview from the gray zone with Anya Parampil and uh, one of the Yemen uh, humanitarian groups that is uh, you know, has been trying to address this humanitarian crisis and also this uh, associate professor who has written this book so um, it sounds like Saudi Arabia is in a despite you know it's it has a kingdom and they're very very rich Mohammed bin Salman is incredibly rich um, despite the monarchy there which is a, a dictatorship basically um, they are doing very badly because of partly because of this ongoing conflict this ongoing war they're waging on Ansar Allah the Houthis in Yemen and uh, they they've been hemorrhaging money and it's uh, it's looking bad for them I'm not sure what's happening by the way um, the uh, the Trump administration I think it was um, his son-in-law Jared Kushner who was uh, actually selling nuclear secrets to Saudi Arabia and at some point Saudi Arabia may actually have a nuclear weapon there's no real mention of that I'm not really sure what's happening there um, I'll have to look into that I don't know I haven't heard anybody mention that but that was something that he was doing throughout that uh, administration and of course Jared Kushner and his wife Ivanka Trump have been raking in the money I think they've made about 120 million dollars personally from their fa their her father in, you know Ivanka Trump's father during that administration they're just a bunch of kleptocrats really so anyway um, it seems like uh, obviously this whole arrangement of trying to destroy the destroy answer Allah has not worked out very well for the coalition I think Qatar is involved in that as well um, the coalition as well as US and the Saudi Saudis so um, so then now they're changing it around and it seems like because of this designation of the Houthis um, you know answer Allah by Trump as an, a terrorist organization and by the way answer Allah has actually been helping provide food for the Yemeni population during this uh, the, during the famine this gen genocide that the Saudis and the US has caused so they actually provide 70% of the food apparently it's it's like a government almost the associate professor was saying so uh, that actually endangers uh, the population further if it if it couldn't be were as bad as it as if it couldn't get any worse so uh, the Biden administration might actually say well if we are to reverse your designation of um, a terrorist organization we expect this from you you know and they sort of change the whole terms of things um, and by the way the Biden administration has uh, has basically despite the fact the US pulled out of the JCPOA um, they're sort of sort of threatening Iran saying you you have to do this and this and this before we will go back to the table and then negotiate a whole different uh, deal which of course will be more in favor for it'll be more beneficial for the US if they do that and uh, they and the US of course has about 800 sanctions on Iran which is causing tremendous economic decline and tremendous suffering and death in Iran at the time of a pandemic these things are happening at the time of a pandemic which shows you what a sadistic monstrous empire with a permanent government that goes through all different governments that goes through all different administrations the Trump administration the Obama administration and now the Biden administration it goes through it's like a a like software running through all those different administrations in other words the permanent government is you know what some would refer to as the deep state or the US national security state that's usually what I call it all these different uh, terrible actions towards countries that are in the crosshair of US Empire uh, the ones and usually there's resources that they want in, in the case of Venezuela and Iran and Yemen and Syria it's oil and of course they look the US Empire looks at full spectrum dominance and it's falling it's failing at the moment uh, so it's actually becoming more and more dangerous resources are um, part of it and uh, 
And unfortunately, these countries um, who just want to either provide resources for their own citizens, it's unacceptable in um, end-stage capitalism to do that. You cannot uh, use your own national resources for your country. Um, the US empire will not allow it. Anyway, so I hope that you find these excerpts that I picked out about, I'm, I'm sorry I went off on a tangent about Iran, but it's all sort of connected. They're going to use this, the, the, um, they've been trying to use this genocide in Yemen and, uh, and also Saudi Arabia hemorrhaging money and, uh, and, and the, all those different, um, they, they're going to use Yemen basically to vilify once again Iran and uh, you know that, that it's sort of like they try and bring in different factors and use certain wars to vilify other, to vilify other countries that are in their crosshairs. So these, these excerpts I pulled out kind of give a brief overview, but the whole um, interview with uh, this professor, and I'm sorry, I think his name is, his last name is Blumi, B-L-U-M-I, um, this professor from Stockholm University. It's actually a really interesting one, and uh, also the, um, the interview with the Yemen humanitarian aid um, group who, who decided to pull out of the U.S. Um, has that because of the designation of the, the Ansarilla as a terrorist group. Um, th that's actually a very interesting interview too. So I hope you find these excerpts interesting. Thanks for watching. My name is Trish Robertson. By the way, please subscribe to my Substack, which is a um, helps me keep in touch with people if ever there is a time where my channel is deleted or blocked or whatever for, by YouTube, um, where you know YouTube is clamping down on the the true left and clamping down on people that are talking about um, imperialism, US imperialism. So um, subscribe to faintsignalsfromvega.substack.com and you'll get probably a couple of uh, emails a week. Um, I haven't decided which is the best thing to do, whether it be a couple of e emails, like putting a few e a few videos in one email from the week uh, and doing two a week, two emails, and then also letting people know about the live stream. Um, you may want to give me some feedback, what you think is the best thing. I don't want to flood people's inboxes with uh, um, too many emails. I know what that's like. I'm on various email lists and, and one doesn't want to get too many emails. So if you think it's best, if you would rather get emails once a day, meaning you would rather get individual emails when I release a video, or would you rather that I put, say, just do two emails a week and put, say, two or three videos in one email and send it out like that and then give you an individual email for um, a note, heads up about a live stream that we might be doing, um, you know, in that, that evening or whatever. So let me know what you think and um, you can tell me in the live stream um, when this video is premiered or in the comment section so that I know what's the best thing to do because I don't want to be a pest <laughs> I don't want to be pesky and uh, you know sort of filling your inbox with emails if you would rather less emails and more videos in the one email so thanks so much for watching uh, stay tuned for this uh, it's probably I think 10 minutes long with various excerpts from these two interviews bye for now in one of its final acts in office, the Trump administration announced it will designate the Houthi movement in Yemen as a terrorist organization. The decision led to international outcry as aid organizations pointed out this action from the United States will virtually halt the delivery of food, medicine, and other types of assistance to Yemen, which is facing the world's worst humanitarian catastrophe since World War II. Your aid group, the Yemen Solidarity Council, announced it will cease operations in the United States. Can you explain why this move from the Trump administration makes your job of pr providing humanitarian assistance to Yemen impossible? You know, the, um, the FTO designation of Ansar Allah makes it, um, in a lack of a better word, uh, quite impossible, to say the least, to raise uh, humanitarian assistance. in especially the United States, because um, the movement, uh, most people with knowledge on the conflict uh, knows and have been uh, underscoring for quite uh, some time, uh, the movement is in control of um, the areas that consist of 80% of the Yemeni people. So it's, it's a government. You have to um, stay in touch and be in touch and coordinate with them to deliver humanitarian assistance. And um, yeah. fundamentally, the FTO designation of Ansala makes this quite impossible. It is impossible, or sorry, it is possible, in fact, in Europe, Asia, and uh, other countries where the group is not designated as a terrorist organization. So we decided from our end that to act proactively and, you know, um, counter this decision uh, without uh, ending up or getting into any legal liabilities, we decided to just halt for the time being our operations in the United States. So. Uh, 
You mentioned other countries or the EU, for example, which have not designated the Houthis as a terrorist group. How has the international community reacted to this decision in Washington? And are you hopeful that the incoming Biden administration might reverse it? Uh, well, um, the international response has been uh, as we expected. Um, the EU uh, the delegation to Yemen uh, released a statement yesterday condemning the uh, Trump uh, administration's decision to uh, designate the uh, designate the Ansarullah as a uh, terrorist organization, and other countries have uh, come forward as well with uh, likewise uh, statements, uh, which uh, no doubt the uh, EU uh, stated yesterday in the statement that they encourage um, uh, uh, talks between all parties. So, and then that's a totally fair statement and a rational statement at that. Um, on the question if Biden would overturn this FTO designation, well, I certainly hope so, um, but I remain uh, quite skeptical if he's gonna do it. Also considering the fact that he has been promising his, uh, his voters to uh, pull the US out of the coalition in Yemen for quite some time during his campaign. And well, to be honest, um, uh, you know, he was vice president when uh, the Obama administration initially pledged its support to assist the uh, Saudi regime in this genocide. And I'm sure, as I've stated previously uh, on other interviews, that he was briefed at the time about the consequences and, and the strategy of the United States. And I'm sure he's being briefed on this as well. I mean, I, I would let time, you know, let time drag out and see what he's going to do. But I'm not too hopeful about it, to be honest. Um, what's interesting about the Obama administration is that just a few months before they gave the green light to Saudi Arabia to invade Yemen in March of 2015, there was talk of them being in alliance with the Houthis because the Houthis were the main force fighting Al Qaeda in Yemen. And let me, let me, let me read you a headline from the Wall Street Journal from January 2015, just months before Obama gave the green light to Saudi Arabia to invade Yemen. It's called, it says, in strategic shift, U.S. draws closer to Yemeni rebels. Washington steps up communication with Houthis to promote stable political transition and fight against Al Qaeda. And a major official involved in this was General Lloyd Austin, who wanted to fight alongside the Houthis, wanted to support the Houthis against Al Qaeda because they were the main force doing it. And Obama essentially told him to back down and that the U.S. was going to shift its support to the Saudi campaign against the Houthis. And I'm just concerned that, uh, unfortunately, he's not going to bring the kind of uh, weight to his position to actually thwart off the Samantha Powers and um, Victoria Newlands and these others, the Susan Rices who are are, who are back, they are back, and this does not bode well for many places, many corners of the world in those unfinished projects they had to bring democracy to the backward global south. There was always the assumption that this war could be won, and the prizes thereof uh, could be then transferred to those who won this war. And, and I'm speaking now, of course, of the coalition that the United States has sustained and will continue to sustain. Again, uh, the problem is also financial. These countries is one of the reasons why they went to war in the first, first place is that our, their long-term term, uh, financial stability is, is un, in question. And I think that's been proven true for the last couple of years. Uh, and Saudi Arabia is, is, is hemorrhaging money because of this war, because of the, the global uh, economy, the dynamics of the shifts in, in, in finance capitalism. And it's not sustainable. And it's not sustainable for the other two um, major regional powers who aim to secure some some of Yemen's most important assets. Uh, uh, firstly, the, the, the kind of the old story of oil and gas. Uh, Yemen has been largely un untapped, uh, unexplored yet. Um, but if you just look at the geology and the geological maps that have been drawn up and are available to uh, oil companies for now for 50, 60 years, they know there's enormous amounts of oil of potential and they know there's n enormous amounts of gas and oil offshore. Uh, they, they're, the geology of Yemen is shared with the Horn of Africa and they're already drilling and have very lucrative uh, projects off the shore of now this, this fragmented what used to be Somalia. Um, and just like with Libya, Somalia, uh, the, um, there are um, these kind of operations to extract 
oil and gas ongoing in Yemen itself. Uh, there is this huge uh, strategic importance of access to the Red Sea and the possibility of extending pipelines to reach the Indian Ocean, not having to deal with the Straits of Hormuz and the ability of Iran to um, thwart the flow of, of oil over the next 20, 30 years is another incentive for to somehow bring Saudi um, uh, territories to the Indian Ocean itself. Um, and likewise, the UAE has its own um, long-term strategic interests, which includes enormous investments they had made before they were uh, their companies were thrown out by this um, interim government in 2012, 2014. The contracts that they, their, uh, Dubai Ports World, for instance, signed were ripped up and uh, Hadi demanded that they be renegotiated under new conditions and Qatari and Saudi companies were going to get the lion's share of that uh, reconfiguration of Yemen's relationship to the global economy. And the fact that Yemenis have um, is geographically located to where most likely in the next 20, 30 years will be uh, the region's uh, source of fresh water as well as farmlands. I'm talking about, about highland Ethiopia. And there have been plans um, in the works for the last 20 years to somehow link by bridge and by pipeline uh, Yemen and thus the entire Arabian Peninsula with Africa uh, to um, uh, streamline the supply chain of food and water that would uh, transform this vision of 2030 that uh, Mohammed bin Salman has been marketing as uh, Saudi Arabia's future. Uh, all these casino towns along the Red Sea coast they are not feasible unless they can find uh, dependable water, uh, dependable labor, uh, and uh, other kinds of resources like food supplies that as we will see, and very soon enough, uh, food will be ro skyrocketing. Commodity prices in general are re already exploding in the markets. And so uh, this was all anticipated a couple of years ago. These were already prepared in reports that were, be were being read by very smart people in Riyadh and Abu Dhabi and Doha. And they had to plan for the um, next 20 years. And one of them was to make sure that they gained access to these key strategic points that will make or break uh, national economies in the future. And Yemen had all the resources necessary to um, assure these regimes uh, survival over the next very tumultuous 20 years, which we're living through right now. <laughs>